When you hear the name Kellogg's, many people immediately think of Pop-Tarts, cereal, and of course, one of their beloved mascots, Tony the Tiger. However, when you take a closer look into the company's history, the recent controversies, and a lot more, you'll find that Kellogg's is up to a lot more than just cereal, frosted treats, and a mascot. From feuding brothers, eugenics, and barbaric health ideals to false advertisements and mistreatment of workers, Kellogg's has a long, convoluted history with an abundance of not-so-great surprises. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we will be exploring the history and public scandals of Kellogg's. There are some graphic mentions of general mutilation. So if that's something you're not comfortable with hearing about at the very moment, feel free to skip this episode. With that being said, let's get into the history of Kellogg's starting with its founders, the feuding Kellogg brothers. Keith and John Harvey Kellogg were born in the 1850s in Battle Creek, Michigan. Throughout their childhood, they were raised in a strict Seventh-day Adventist household. According to the religion's website, they are a global family of Christians who hold the Bible as the ultimate authority. They also say there are a few distinguishing characteristics that set them apart from many other Christian denominations. According to their website, they look to Jesus Christ alone for salvation, acknowledge the call to be unique or set apart from the world and believe the Bible introduces you to God. John Harvey and Will Keith, otherwise known as WK, held on to their beliefs tightly and continued to adhere to them and use them as they grew up. In 1875, John Harvey Kellogg received his MD from the Bellevue Hospital Medical College with the support of his family and of course, his church community. John Harvey Kellogg was a staunch advocate of what was called biological living. This type of living included a wide range of restrictions and rules. To adhere to biological living, one must abstain from alcohol, tobacco, tea, coffee, meat, and masturbation. One of these is clearly not like the others, but I digress. Not only did John Harvey Kellogg adhere to this strict lifestyle himself, but he also promoted this to others. Only one year after receiving his MD, he became the superintendent of the Seventh-day Adventist Western Health Reform Institute, which later became the Battle Creek Sanatorium. The Battle Creek Sanatorium quickly became the most popular medical spa in the United States, attended by presidents, movie stars, and business giants, including John Harvey Kellogg's own brother, Will, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Amelia Earhart. The medical spa followed John's unique views on health, which included some peculiar spa inventions and protocols. For one, Kellogg believed that people should chew their food at least 40 times before they swallow it. Apparently, this was supposed to have some sort of health or mental benefits. This has been a widely spread belief that doing this would prevent acid reflux. However, according to recent research, there doesn't seem to be a scientific backing for this. Kellogg was so serious about this chewing protocol though, that he developed a song that contained the lines, chewing song and chew, 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 that is the thing to do. And not chew, chew like a train, but C-H-E-W, chew. Odd, but you know, to each their own, I suppose. The Battle Creek Sanatorium also offered something called a continuous bath. The continuous bath was just like a regular bathtub, but continuous truly lived up to its name. The bath could last for many hours, days, weeks, or months. Patients were allowed to leave the bathtub to go to the bathroom, but that's about it. Kellogg said these were used to treat multiple mental or physical issues such as skin diseases, chronic diarrhea, delirium, hysteria, and mania. It's definitely an odd treatment, but not the strangest when it came to this spa. Perhaps the most bizarre and brutal were the masturbation cures developed by John. John Harvey called masturbation a solitary vice and vile practice. He said that masturbation caused poor digestion, memory loss, impaired vision, heart disease, epilepsy, and insanity, which just, it isn't true for the record. He developed treatments to cure young boys of the solitary vice that were, for lack of a better word, barbaric. One treatment including tying young boys' hands or bandaging their sexual organ and putting a cage over it. And I think now that's like a thing. Isn't that something people are into? I don't know, I've, I've heard about it. I'm not very good at this stuff. Anyway, the girls' treatments, however, were even worse and included carbolic acid being applied to the clitoris. Apparently, if these already horrific strategies did not work, Kellogg advocated for circumcision without anesthetic. He believed that the pain associated with circumcision would stop young boys from wanting to touch themselves anymore. Now, not only did John Harvey Kellogg have some barbaric views regarding masturbation, but he was also a staunch eugenist, a racist quote, 
science, unquote, which advocates for white people being the superior race biologically. Despite this flawed belief, Kellogg and his wife had fostered over 42 children in their lives of various races because they believed that the environment could overcome hereditary tendencies. Even so, Kellogg believed what many other eugenicists also did at the time, that the white race was being threatened by racial mixing. Because of this, he pushed for eugenic legislation that would ban interracial relationships and founded the Race Betterment Foundation. This organization obviously promoted his beliefs and encouraged what he called people with, quote, good pedigrees to have children to save the human race. And I just wanna gag so hard. It is, you know, every once in a while, it's horrific to have to quote something. And this is just one of those moments. This is obviously disgusting. I don't think I really have to explain why these types of beliefs and practices are wrong genital mutilation, especially of a young person that may not understand their sexual urges is child abuse to one of the highest degrees. Even though Kellogg's may not be run by this man now, considering that this was in the 1850s when this was going on, it's worth looking back in time to see the dark origins of this massive household name. Now that we have a little bit of background on the eccentric, and if we're being honest, extremely problematic, John Harvey Kellogg, let's get into the history of the company itself. While running the Battle Creek Sanatorium, WK and John discovered that the biological living diet was boring their patients. Considering it was mostly just bread and vegetables with no flavoring, this is not super surprising. Upon learning this, John and Will started to experiment, trying to develop new health foods their patients could enjoy. They experimented with products like cereal granola biscuits, wheat flakes, and peanut butter coffee substitutes. While trying to develop a new form of bread, John Harvey Kellogg and Will Kellogg stumbled across the thing that would soon spark two companies and multiple lawsuits between them, cornflakes. This is largely considered to be the world's first cereal product, and it was clear that they had stumbled onto something big. Originally, the brothers sold cornflakes by mail order to ex-patients, but after one of their patients, CW, started to sell granola biscuits and a cereal-based drink called Postum, earning him roughly $3 million in a year in 1900, one of the brothers, Will, started to take notice. Now, Will was the more business-minded of the two brothers, and he began advertising their cornflake product in newspapers and billboards. In 1906, Will Kellogg founded the Toasted Cornflake Company he immediately implemented an aggressive advertising campaign, including billboards and pamphlets. One of these read, wink at your grocer and see what you get. Now, considering his brother's extremely conservative thinking and way of living, this did not sit well with him. Just as a quick side note slash kind of fun fact here, Will apparently chose the rooster to be the mascot for the company because he liked the Welsh word for rooster, which I'm going to butcher, but it looks like it's Celiog, Celiog, because it sounded like his last name. So clearly the Kellogg name was very important to him. And this is important to remember as we move forward. The introduction of cereal was changing the way people approached breakfast. Before cereal, people spent hours cooking grains to melt them down into a porridge and ate potatoes that had been fried in fat, a far cry from the biological lifestyle that John was hoping to promote. The cereal that was introduced was not only far less time consuming to make in the morning, but outrageously more healthy. But the massive success of cereal caused tension between the two brothers. After seeing his brother's initial success, John Harvey started to make and sell his own cereal and call it Kellogg's. By this time, Will had already spent millions of dollars on advertisements and felt that another brand using the name Kellogg's would harm his company. And so Will sued John Harvey, to which John responded by suing Will. This lawsuit went on for over 10 years and ended up going to the Michigan State Supreme Court. In 1911, Will Kellogg came out as the victor and earned the rights to be the sole person who could use the name Kellogg. And so the future multi-billion dollar company that was solidified in name and it began to grow. And it grew so much that the brothers got in yet another legal battle, this time arguing over who could use the family name internationally. The lawsuit started in 1916 and wasn't settled until 1921, where once again, Will came out victorious. Will officially changed the name to the Kellogg Cereal Company in 1922. In 1923, the company hired its first dietitian to help create products and recommend a diet to consumers. Then in 1924, WK was joined by his son, John L. Kellogg. Now, John L. Kellogg had invented Allbran, which the company had been selling since 1916. But before long, less than one year later, he was unceremoniously forced out of the company. History Today reports that this was done for two reasons. The first being that John L. had divorced his wife and married another woman from the office. Apparently this was so outrageously immoral to Will that he could no longer work with his son. The second reason was that John became interested in oat-based projects, which Will disapproved of. 
People who joined Will at Kellogg never seemed to last long, and he actually ended up giving a majority interest of his company to his charity, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, which was founded in 1930. When the W.K. Kellogg Foundation was created, its purpose was defined as administering funds for the promotion of the welfare, comfort, health, education, feeding, clothing, sheltering, and safeguarding of children and youth, directly or indirectly, without regard to sex, race, creed, or nationality. W.K. also left instructions to future trustees and staff that they should use the money as you please so long as it promotes the health, happiness, and well-being of children. Today, the WK Foundation continues as a private organization funded by Kellogg's and their website claims they are among the world's largest private foundations. And maybe you're just a little bit confused as I am because it just is weird to hear that WK really wanted to donate regardless of race when his brother was a eugenicist who still adopted children of multiple races. Maybe WK didn't support those eugenicist beliefs though his brother did and honestly, I'm, Imagining to a degree WK was probably doing this just to piss off his eugenicist brother. And it's kind of funny, but also kind of fucked up. By the time Will died in 1951, Kellogg's was the world leader in the ever growing breakfast food and cereal industry. Over its 100 years in existence, the company has continued to grow, release new foods and acquire other companies. In 1999, the company had its first big merger and bought the Morningstar Farms soy-based vegetarian foods. Over the years following, they would buy the Keebler Company, Pringles, and RX Bar. And before we go on to talk about Kellogg's and their sugar and settlements, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2022, why overpay for wireless service? Especially when Mint Mobile service starts at just 15 bucks a month. I've been using them for over a year now and they have been one of the most satisfying and easy to work with companies I think I've worked with when it comes to using a cell phone. One of my favorite parts about them is that they sell their service online only. So they pass that savings on to you. But almost more importantly, in my opinion, is that I don't have to go into a store. I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't even have to call anybody. They literally have an app. If you want to download it onto your phone so you can switch that way, or you can just do it on your computer. You don't have to even talk to anybody. But when you do have to talk to somebody, they're actually very nice. All their plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. So if you want to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. There's so many products right now promising a good night's sleep because truly who is sleeping well lately. Well, nothing helps more than getting a better mattress. And that's why it's worth getting a purple mattress. Only purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid, a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. The Gel Flex Grid supports your back and legs and yet also cushions your shoulders, neck, and hips. I'm actually really impressed by how well it doesn't retain heat. I recently, like most of my life, I've been a cold sleeper, but as of recently, I've been sleeping really, really warm and purple has been helping keep that a little bit more under control. And not to mention last year, they sent me their purple pillows and Casper stole them. And as you guys know, he's an Arctic dog. So he's obviously always very warm and covered in fur and he loves that thing. So I only assume it's very cooling for him too. And you can try your purple mattress risk-free with free shipping and returns. Financing is also available too. And getting that great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. So get a purple mattress, go to purple.com slash casket and use code casket. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket with code casket for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Purple.com slash casket, promo code casket. Terms apply. So Kellogg's was widely developed under the idea that food could be healthy and quick, but as time has gone by, their food hasn't exactly lived up to those ideals or standards. In a lawsuit filed in 2016, the company was accused of falsely advertising the health of their food by placing words like healthy, nutritious, and wholesome on their packaging. This seemed pretty dishonest as the sugar contents of that same food were outrageously high. Stephen Hadley, the plaintiff in the case, said the food was composed of 18 to 40% added sugar. According to Harvard, consuming high amounts of sugar can lead to high blood pressure, inflammation, weight gain, diabetes, and fatty liver disease. All of these things also place people at a higher risk of experiencing a heart attack or stroke. So with all of that in mind, it's understandable that there was concern with the company portraying their product as healthy while simultaneously packing added sugar into those very same products. Kellogg's responded to the suit by saying it, quote, never advertised these breakfast products as low sugar or reduced sugar, nor has it hidden the sugar content. 
To the contrary, every consumer knows the product sugar content is clearly listed on the Nutrition Facts panel. And the names of these products, such as Crave S'more and Cinnamon Roll Frosted Mini Wheats, obviously alert consumers that these sweet tasting items have some added sugar. And while yes, names like Cinnamon Roll Frosted Mini Wheats or Crave S'mores definitely imply some sugar is being added, as we all know, these are not the only cereals the company has to offer. And even their other cereals like Frosted Mini Wheats, Raisin Bran, and Smart Start have high levels of added sugar. Raisin Bran has 19 grams of sugar per serving, Mini Wheats has 12 grams, and Smart Start cereal has 18 grams. Unlike the other cereals, those names wouldn't immediately alert you to high sugar content. And for the record, Harvard recommends that women consume no more than 24 grams of sugar in a day, and men consume no more than 36 grams. So one serving of these cereals listed in the lawsuit can take either half or more of your recommended sugar consumption a day. Not exactly what you want from a health brand. It's also good to note the United States has allowed astronomically more added sugar in food than most other countries without a warning to the consumer. For example, in Mexico, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on, foods that have over 10% of daily calories and sugar content are considered to be excessive. Products that have excess added sugar have to put a warning label on the front of the products. The United States, on the other hand, has no such law. The FDA does not define what high or low sugar is or set conditions for it. It only has conditions on reduced, less, lower sugar claims. Simply put, it means that if the added sugar is considered excessive or more than 10%, a company doesn't actually have to warn consumers. But if they use the words reduced, less, or lower, or something similar, and that turns out to be untrue, then that can be considered a false advertisement. After more than three years of arguments back and forth, the two parties involved in the lawsuit finally agreed to a settlement. Of course, Kellogg's denies any wrongdoing or responsibility in the settlement, though they did allocate $20 million to a settlement fund for people to claim their money back or receive vouchers. The company also agreed to limit the use of the words wholesome, nutritious, or benefits to specific ingredients rather than the entire product for three years. Additionally, they agreed to remove heart health from their branding on Smart Start and Raisin Bran for two years and remove no high fructose corn syrup from all their products for at least three years. Now, I'm not 100% sure why these time limits were placed on it, but the gist is they agreed to stop falsely advertising the health of their products for a couple years. The court approved the settlement on November 23rd, 2021, and the call for people to submit claims to get a voucher or their money back was released. The class included all persons in the United States who between August 29th, 2012 and May 1st, 2020, purchased in the United States for household use and not for resale or distribution of one of the class products. In the call for claims, it was estimated that anyone who submitted a claim and was approved to participate in the settlement would receive $16.90 back. Oh, and unfortunately the deadline on this has already passed, just in case you were wondering, sorry about that. The distribution of the settlement cash started on January 20th, 2022. So not much went back to consumers, but the main takeaway here is that Kellogg's cereal doesn't seem to be as health focused as they originally claimed, and people have been starting to take notice. Kellogg's also found themselves in multiple other lawsuits involving false advertisements in 2021. This time, their wheat strawberry Pop-Tarts were the focus. The class action lawsuit filed in Illinois by Anita Harris argued that Pop-Tarts, which advertised a strawberry filling were, gasp, not actually filled with strawberries. Instead, Pop-Tarts contained 2% or less of dried strawberry, dried pear, dried apple, and red 40. The lawsuit states, Whether a toaster pastry contains only strawberries or merely some strawberries is basic front label information consumers rely on when making quick decisions at a grocery store. Strawberries are the product's characterizing ingredient. Consumers believe they are present in an amount greater than is the case. Harris said that the product cannot provide a true strawberry taste and the red food coloring gave consumers the false impression that Pop-Tarts had more strawberries in them. She said she would not have bought them if she had known the truth about how they were made. Another lawsuit filed in Dutchess County, New York by Elizabeth Russett sought $5 million in compensation and demanded a jury trial. Like the Illinois lawsuit, this one accused Kellogg's of misleading advertisements on Pop-Tarts that it made and it seemed like they contained more strawberries than they really do. This claim said that the Pop-Tarts inclusion of strawberries was insufficient, not merely to provide the nutrient benefits of strawberries, but to provide a strawberry taste. Additionally, the lawsuit suggests that the price of strawberry Pop-Tarts is so high that consumers would not pay that much if they knew there were very few strawberries in them. There is one other lawsuit from New York that alleges that the Kellogg Pop-Tarts are being falsely advertised. A spokesperson for the company said they don't comment on pending litigation, but the ingredients in the labeling of all our Pop-Tart products fully comply with all legal requirements. Now these lawsuits are still pending, so we'll have to wait and see if another costly settlement is reached in the future.
high in sugar unhealthy health cereals and other products aren't the only thing that has caused the public to question this company. On October 5th, 2021, 1400 workers went on strike after they and Kellogg's were unable to come to an agreement during contract negotiations. Workers at multiple Kellogg's plants had been required to work longer hours and weekend shifts during the pandemic, some working as much as 80 hours per week. One worker on strike, Trevor Biddleman, a fourth generation employee told The Guardian, this is after just one year ago, we were hailed as heroes as we worked through the pandemic seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Now apparently we are no longer heroes. We don't have weekends really. We just work seven days a week, sometimes 100 to 130 days in a row. The bakery, confectionery, tobacco workers, and Grain Millers International Union claimed that employees were required to work overtime hours, and the company apparently had a point system that dings you if you dare beg for time off to go watch your son's Little League game. Kellogg's refuted this claim in the not so best way ever and said that their employees are required to only work 52 to 56 hours per week and overtime is voluntary. Even if this is true, 52 to 56 hours per week is a lot of hours. Workers said that before the strike even began, Kellogg's had stopped hiring workers when others quit or retired. Employees said they were doing this for two reasons, so they could spend less money on benefits and to ensure there would be fewer workers if a strike did occur, which as we know, it did. Workers on strike were not only asking for a change in the hours, but also pushing for a change in pay structure. A previous compensation structure agreed to in 2015 was designed with a two-tier payment structure. New employees would earn lower wages and fewer benefits than the veteran workers in the company. There's unfortunately not a lot of clarity as to what constitutes new versus veteran, but it does seem that an employee can be considered new for multiple years. So even if someone had worked for the company for over one year, they were still considered new and were on the lower payment plan and received fewer benefits than other workers. I can definitely see where some of the anger would come from. When these concerns were first addressed by the union in 2015, Kellogg's threatened to close two factories if the two tier structure was not accepted. They claimed that cereal sales were down and they could not afford to pay their employees equally. The union agreed to the two tier structure and the company promised that when a higher tier worker retired, a new worker would advance to the higher pay tier. And of course, that's not what actually happened. Instead of promoting one person for every one who left, the company actually only promoted one for every three people who left. And that kept those in the lower tier with less money and fewer benefits than their counterparts. In 2021, Kellogg's announced more than $4 billion in profits. The same year, the CEO made a $1.3 million salary and a $3.3 million bonus. This is roughly 279 times the amount of money made by a median Kellogg's employee. With Kellogg's announcing more than $4 billion with a B in gross profits in 2021, the same year where employees were working over 80 hours a week just to provide the product, this was the perfect opportunity for employees to use a strike to demand better working conditions. They joined over 100,000 other employees from other industries that went on strike around the same time. This simultaneous wave of strikes in the United States was given the name Striketober. But as Rolling Stone calls them, the Fruit Loop Lords quickly showed that they would do anything possible to avoid reaching an agreement with their employees. When the strike first started, the company almost immediately cut the healthcare benefits to their workers. During a deadly international pandemic, their first step was to cut health benefits. Therefore, many of the employees on strike opted either to pay for individual health insurance, costing up to $2,900. Others who likely could not afford the hefty bill associated with individual health insurance were forced to go without insurance during the strike, which even in normal times is obviously not ideal. But during an international pandemic, it's even worse. One employee has a daughter who required special medication for a pre-existing condition. He was not able to get individual insurance and said that his daughter was having anxiety over the cost of her medication. He told the Rolling Stone he was hoping to ride it out. And I think the pandemic has really shown the true colors of many large corporations because we've really begun to see how little they actually give a damn about the health and safety of their workers. Kellogg's isn't the only one to treat its workers this way, but it's still extremely depressing to see. In December, 2021, the strike took a turn for the worst when the 1400 workers declined an offer by the company of a 3% pay increase, which considering that the CEO of the company gave himself $3.3 million in bonuses, I could definitely see why an offer of 3% would be declined. And that's beside the point that I don't think that even covers the cost of inflation for this year either. At this point, the strike had been going on for over two months and workers were without pay, health insurance, and were constantly bombarded by high volume lights at night. After the terms offered by the company were rejected overwhelmingly, Kellogg's officially announced that they would be hiring permanent replacement employees in positions vacated by striking workers. Chris Hood, the president of Kellogg's North American, said the decision was because the company had an obligation to our customers and consumers to continue to provide the cereals they know and love. 
Hood also said the decision to hire permanent replacement employees was not the result the company was hoping for. Now, your first thought might be the same one I had because this seems like this should be illegal, but unfortunately it is not. Hiring permanent replacement workers during a strike over economic issues is perfectly legal within the United States. The US House of Representatives passed a bill in March, 2021 called Protecting the Rights to Organize or PRO Act. This act would amend past American labor laws, help protect workers from being fired or replaced during strikes or contract negotiations. And it allows the government to have more power to punish employers who did violate workers' rights. President Biden, who is supportive of the bill said, as America works to recover from the devastating challenges of a deadly pandemic and economic crisis and reckoning on race that reveals deep disparities, we need to summon a new wave of worker power to create an economy that works for everyone. Even though the bill passed in the house, not everyone is a fan. Virginia Fox, a representative from North Carolina said the bill is radical backward looking legislation, which will diminish the rights of workers and employers while harming the economy and providing a political gift to labor unions. Political experts don't expect the Senate to pass the bill. So for now, it remains legal for employers to retaliate against workers by firing or replacing them during union contract negotiations. Now, just because something is legal, it obviously does not mean that everyone thinks it's right. This certainly is the case with this situation. And the announcement that Kellogg's plan to end bargaining and hire permanent workers was met with near instant public outrage. A subreddit called Anti-Work had been documenting the strike since the beginning and users and followers expressed outrage when Kellogg's announced that it would be replacing workers. I'm not gonna get too much into that subreddit because I know one of the moderators, one on Fox News got absolutely fucking obliterated and yada, 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 some stuff happened there, not fun. Uh, And the subreddit from my understanding is kind of dying now because of it, but I'm not entirely sure what the deal is. But the point is that subreddit really began to bloom and blossom as the strikes were going on and Kellogg's made these really terrible announcements. Now, shortly after the company announced they would be hiring workers after 77 days on strike, it ended. The union announced that the workers had voted to accept a new agreement. The new agreement would graduate lower tier employees after four years of experience into the higher tier of pay and benefits. The agreement also included cost of living increases from $19.92 an hour to $24.11 per hour. Chris Banner, a spokesman for Kellogg said after the announcement, we are pleased to have reached an agreement that brings our cereal employees back to work. We look forward to their return and continuing to produce our beloved cereal brands for our customers and consumers. The thing is, Kellogg's had brought in permanent replacement workers and they would be staying after the people striking return to work. This means that the people who had been in the picket line for 77 days would be working next to those who were brought in to replace them. It would not be surprising if there was just a little bit of animosity there, possibly creating a relatively hostile work environment. The Omaha union president said, it will be difficult to go back. There is a lot of tarnished relationships. However, he also said, this was a big win, not only for us, but for the American labor movement. We stood up for what we believed was right. We stood the line and we made the sacrifice to fight the giant that is Kellogg's. We're better for it. However, this is not the most recent news to come out about Kellogg's. In a relatively shocking move, Mexico sees 380,000 boxes of Kellogg's cereal cornflakes and Special K, among with others in January, 2021. The Mexican government had just passed laws that outlawed companies using marketing tactics to appeal to children. This was done to improve the health of children and combat them from choosing overly sugary or unhealthy foods because of their cartoons or mascots. Kellogg's of course is famous for their mascots, their catchphrases, and their loudly colored cereal boxes placing them at the top of the list of companies who use marketing tactics to appeal to children. The Consumer Protection Agency in Mexico said that the cereal was seized because they did not state the nutritional values such as calories, fats, salt, or sugar on the boxes and did not have any warning of that any of those ingredients are excessively used in the product. As we know, this has been a continuous problem with Kellogg's products, and I guess Mexico decided they had enough and good for them, honestly. America has no rules or regulations regarding the use of children-based marketing in the food industry, and it's a widely used tactic by a plethora of companies, not just Kellogg's. So there's an extremely slim chance that the United States will ever see something similar to this in the future. Though with Kellogg's continuous lawsuits of false advertisements over their so-called health foods, maybe it's something that should be considered. From feuding founders to false advertisements to horrendous work conditions, Kellogg's has definitely had one hell of an interesting history. Hopefully people who work for the company will be treated fairly moving forward and the false advertisements will stop. But as always, only time will tell. And with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you are liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I wanna thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.